love you all. Be blessed. And thank you, Jan Bell. I think this is a timely word for us. I think as we begin what is normally a, a busy holiday season with a lot of things going on, a lot of activity and movement. I know most of you know a little bit of my story, but just in case you don't, when I was 20, I became saved. Jesus met me because someone came after me when I was a lost sheep. I preached about that a couple weeks ago. And when I was 23, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was being called into youth ministry. I had been studying to be a counselor, and the Lord called me into youth ministry. And there was a period of about nine months between that call and the Lord opening a door for me to go and serve. And that was the First Presbyterian Church in Barlesville. I was there for eight years. It was a wonderful season of ministry. I was the youth minister and worship minister. That was where I, I met Miranda, and then we, we got married, and that was a ministry we got to share together, and that, that was incredibly special. But what I found, I was, a, I was a younger man. I was 25 when I, I started serving in that role. I found that there would be seasons, periods of days or weeks, maybe months, I don't know, where I would be serving in this ministry capacity, but I wasn't connected to the Lord. And I realized as I got older and matured how dangerous that was. But that's like burning the candle at both ends, a really, really short candle burning at both ends. And so I wonder if y'all have ever felt like that. Because that's not just serving in ministry, that's life, isn't it? As we have all the busyness and responsibilities and everything that gets thrown at us, it's so easy to find ourselves disconnected. And all of a sudden we look and we go, oh my goodness, I haven't had a chance to open the Bible however many days. I just feel dry. I feel empty. I feel exhausted. Physically, spiritually, everything. Well, if, if you've ever been there, or if you're there now, this is the sermon for you. Because I know I feel like that sometimes. And it's why it's so important for us that we remember who our source is. And it's God. It's not us. It's not our gifts, abilities, strength, and determination not being able to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, pull it together, it's God. God alone is our source. So the question I'm asking us today is, who is your source? And we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 41. But before we go there, I'd like for us to pray together. Because God, you are the source of all things. And we need you. Just like we sang earlier, Lord, we need you. We need you every hour, every moment. God, today would you help us see you for who you are? That you, you don't just come and tell us what to do and how to live, but you want to empower us to live the way that you've called us to live. Thank you for that grace, Jesus. And forgive us for the countless times that we strike out on our own strength. God, would you bring us back to the foot of the cross today in humility and need to receive this gift of strength you want to give us. God, would you open your word to us today. Bring it to new life, Holy Spirit. We pray in your name. Amen. So Isaiah 40, 25 through 41 says, To whom then will you compare me? that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out the host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? And then there's a new slide for, for verse 28, Jerome. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Now this chapter has begun with comfort for God's people in Israel. Uh, They're in exile, I'm sorry. And their hope that God is immeasurably great and powerful. And this has also been contrasted with the frailty of human strength, as well as the worthless nature of idols. And just before the passage we read today, God has put in perspective what seems like the greatest human powers. But even those come and go. Think about the empires in history that rose and then fell and never returned to the same prominence. Think about Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, Rome. Even into modern times, there was a time when they said the sun never sets on the British Empire. I guarantee you it does now. These kings and empires that seem so mighty wither and blow away. But God remains. Now, God's people, whom Isaiah was writing to, were currently being held captive in exile in Babylon. That Babylonian empire sure seemed pretty strong and mighty to them. And they're wondering if God has forgotten them, maybe even if God is real. And it's there that God speaks the hope that we heard today. God is not like the kings of this earth, so it isn't even a fair comparison. And nor is he like the weak, false gods of the Babylonians. God placed all the stars, and he knows them by name. Okay, footnote nerd alert. Uh, (laughs) Astronomers estimate that there were approximately 5,000 stars visible in the night sky in the ancient Near East. 5,000. That's a lot. That's impressive, right? So the people who are reading this look up, they can see about 5,000 stars and say, wow, God knows all of these and knows them all by name. He placed them there, he holds them there, he knows them. Now, modern science has shown us, begun to show us, the sheer magnitude of the universe, right? They now estimate that there are 1 times 10 to the 22nd or 10 billion trillion stars. That's a lot. I can't begin to fathom the size and scale, the vastness, and the number that God placed them all, and he knows each one by name. And by the greatness of his might, not one of them is missing. Now, of course, the stars were not meant to be worshipped, but to show evidence of God's great design and power and draw us to worship him. Think about Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, right? But Israel had repeatedly gone astray. They'd been given chance after chance after chance after chance. Which is why this finally happened, why they were taken into exile. Yet even though they deserved this exile they were in, God was still with them. This was not like a normal covenant in the ancient Near East, because the moment the one party breaks it, the covenant's over. No, our God is the one who comes after to bring back into covenant. And even though they doubted his goodness and redemption, he would again move on their behalf. He is not simply strong, powerful, and right wise. We read that, didn't we? In verse 29 it said, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. He gives strength to those who have none. The Israelites were weary. They were in a place that wasn't their home. Looked like there was no hope, at least not that they could see God wanted to come and meet them there and give them strength to endure. Just like we're weary sometimes. And just like God wants to give us strength to endure and to be his light. It continues in verse 30. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Have you all seen the movie Remember the Titans? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember that scene when they're having the team meeting and, uh, and the one guy, it, now Rand, remind me, what's What's that verse you're always saying to me when I'm upset about my homework and you start singing this horribly off-key? It's, it's such a, a priceless moment. It's a, I, I enjoy that movie. I thought about showing the clip. I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. The very picture of strength and vitality gets tired. 
I like to watch football. And I'm always amazed at the things these guys can do. Just those crazy plays and catches and tackles and all the crazy cool stuff that they can do. It's almost superhuman. Or if we go back a little bit, like we think about Michael Jordan. Remember, he used to, to jump from the free throw line to dunk it. Oh, my goodness. It's like the man hung in air. I remember when Bo Jackson, who was also a great football player, and he played baseball for the Royals, and he, he ran up on the back wall as he made a catch. Oh, my goodness. That man is probably one of the greatest athletes who has ever lived. They're amazing. They get tired. They get weary. They get spiritually sick and tired in their souls. I think about my friend Remington. This guy's a strong guy. I don't know if y'all know that. He's a strong fella. A few months ago, he really graciously came over and helped us rearrange some furniture. We had a bedroom upstairs and a bedroom downstairs, and we needed to swap them because we needed to give Miss Laurel some space. And it worked great. She started sleeping a lot better. So yeah, just come over. We're just, just going to switch some furniture around. No big deal. Y'all know. Y'all have moved. You know. You know. It's never just a little switch. It was in the heat of the summer. We had the AC running full blast. But, well, I'm sure he didn't break a sweat at all, but I was dripping. <laughs> and we were exhausted. We finally finished. We had done it. We were exhausted. I said, thank you, Lord, that I'm not moving my entire house right now. This was plenty. <laughs> but a strong young man like Remington was tired and weary. So then verse 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Did you catch that? This is not a passive sitting back waiting to see what will happen. I'm not sitting in the waiting room at the restaurant waiting for my table. No, this is, a, this is pressing in. This is very, very active. This is coming to the Lord in dependence and trust. It's pressing in. It's pursuing. It's like Jesus told the parable of the pearl of great price. The man finds it. And then goes and sells everything he has so that he can buy the pearl, right? We've kind of found the pearl of great price. And now we're in the process, we're in the lifelong journey of coming back to fully take hold of what we've already seen. And what God has taken hold of us for, more importantly. It's a journey of walking with God, continually learning to die to ourselves. And growing in his grace and goodness. And this passage says that as we do that, he renews our strength. He who does not grow faint or weary gives us that same strength as we wait for him, as we walk with him. That we shall metaphorically, spiritually, be raised up on wings like eagles. Did you know eagles can fly at heights of 10,000 feet? I learned that this week. That's high! That is so high! why they don't have many natural predators who can get them. And that's why they're such fierce natural predators. And even though God doesn't raise us up literally to fly 10,000 feet in the air, that'd be cool. He raises us up spiritually. It's a metaphor. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Sometimes in life, the hardest thing in the world is to just keep walking forward. Those great athletes that we were talking about, they're amazing. But we're not even trying to talk about that. We're just trying to talk about keeping going where we are and the circumstances we're in to just keep walking forward. When we come back to the Lord day after day after day as we seek to walk in his light, he renews our strength to help us keep walking. So who is your source? I know for me it's way too easy to 
fall back on my own strength, my own gifts, my own abilities. Oh, I only have this much time. I've got to get X, Y, Z done. I just slip back into that mode. I think we're all pretty gifted people and can do that. And we can get a long way. But we're burning that candle at both ends. I think each of us, if we took time, we could all speak to that. So here's the thing, though. Isaiah 40 is not the only place that this idea shows up in Scripture. This idea of God being our source, of God providing all that we need. And so I found, I think, about 15, and I think I'm still just scratching the surface, Scriptures that I would just like to share with us today. I'm hoping the word of the Lord is going to speak to our hearts in a way that I can. And so I've, I've put these on the screen. And Jerome, if you would go, we'll start at Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Thank you so much, brother. You're doing a fantastic job up there today. BJ is out hill, and Jerome is graciously stepping in. And we sure appreciate you guys. So Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Of course, the yoke was the thing that they put over two oxen so that they could plow the field together. The yoke that we take with Christ that he wants to help us carry is easy and light. The burden that we're carrying around on our own is hard. He wants to give us rest for our souls. So then the next one, John 7, 37 to 38. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I just learned about living water this week. About how important it was to baptize and living water in a, in a lot of cultures. And I think we've lost sight of that. But that idea of moving water that has a source that's going somewhere, not like the, the Dead Sea that doesn't have any outlets. Living water. Jesus wants to put living water into our hearts. The next one, Psalm 1-3. And this psalm is about the person who, who meditates on God's word, who studies it, who treasures God's word. And it says that he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. I don't know if y'all have ever driven up to Bartlesville, but just south of Bartlesville on Highway 75, there's the, this plain, and it's the, the Caney River overflow. And there's always water right there. There's, there's several kind of big ponds or small lakes. And there are all these trees, and there's a bunch of cattle on this land. And I've always been struck by the trees. Because even in the hottest summer, the driest drought, those trees look beautiful. They're green, they're healthy, and it's because their roots are right there by the water. It's so striking. And the psalmist is saying that when we are connected with our source, when we are in God's word, we're like a tree planted by streams of water. No drought will ever touch it. My daughter's not a fan of my preaching today. <laughs> I'll try to wrap it up, baby. <laughs> the next one, Jerome, is John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered, and this is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. It's a fountain that won't run, run dry drawing up of this water from our hearts. The next one, Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail. In fact, they will fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I've always loved that song. The next one is Romans 15, 13. And Paul says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's something that only the Holy Spirit can do in us, isn't it? That 
we don't just get by in this life and survive and you know, punch our card and end up in heaven by the grace of God. No, he wants to give us fullness, abundance, eternal life here and now on earth. The next one is Psalm 62, 1 and 2. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be greatly shaken. That idea, for God alone my soul waits. God, would you refine my heart and my soul so that it only waits for you? Because I know I'm distracted. The next one is Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 13. Paul writing from prison, awaiting his execution. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Turns out that's not just about benching 500 pounds, but that's pretty cool too. But I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Even keep walking. The next one is Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 through 19. Habakkuk is such an interesting book. We should, we should study that together sometime. Habakkuk is complaining to the Lord. And he has a pretty good case, I think, that but kind of like Job, God blows it out of the water. And it ends with this beautiful hymn. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. If you'll notice, those are all the things the ancient Israelites would have depended on, right? That's where they get their food, their sources of income, every bit of security that they could have in this life, even if there's none of it. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. John 15, 4 and 5. Remain in me as I also remain in you. That's Jesus talking, by the way. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We must make our home in Jesus. We must remain connected to our source. Then we can bear fruit. Then we can do the things that we want to do. We can begin to be the people we want to be, the people that God's called us to be. But on our own steam, we can't. We fall short. It says we can do nothing. The next one is Psalm 23, 1 through 3. And this is the New Living Translation version. I've always appreciated this wording. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths bringing honor to his name as we walk with our souls, as we walk with our God. He brings us rest. He renews our strength. And he guides us, the other translations say, he guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. It's for our glory, or his glory and our good that he leads us in the right path. John 10.10 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus is speaking metaphorically about our enemy here. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Does that mean that we're all going to be driving around in Porsches? Oh, we saw a Lamborghini the other day. That was cool. But I don't think that's what that means. Jesus is wanting to give us an abundance inside us, a spiritual abundance. Even as we trust him to meet all of our and the last one, Exodus 33, it's a wonderful chapter. Moses is saying, how on earth am I supposed to do everything that you're asking me to do, God? You've told me to lead these people, but you haven't told me who's going to go with me. And God says to him, my presence will go with you, 
and I will give you rest. And Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us, because we don't want to go. How would anyone on earth know that we're different, that there's anything special about us if your presence doesn't come with us? I think that's a prayer that we can pray today. And if you want that list of scriptures, please let me know. I'll be happy to email it to you or share it with you somehow. I know I threw a lot at y'all very, very quickly. And again, I think I'm only scratching the surface there. I'm sure you all remember the account of the Exodus and then the Israelites wandering in the desert. Oh, we've talked about it several times the last couple of months. And, and that time period as they were on their way to the promised land and then on the brink of it, making their way into it. And God provided manna and quail in the wilderness. Y'all, y'all remember it. It's, they would go out and it looked like dew on the ground and they would gather it up. And it was the bread that they lived on. And Moses instructed the people to only take the certain amount that you need for each day. But of course there's that guy, and I probably would have been that guy, who gathered too much. We kick into that survival mode that I've got to hoard everything up and store away as much as I can for a rainy day because I don't know if this stuff's going to be there tomorrow. And do you remember the account when they did the next morning that had maggots in it? And yet, when they gathered twice as much before the Sabbath, it was preserved. We all have this tendency to fall into that place of security and hoarding up for ourselves to make sure that we're safe and protected and provided for. But God is saying, my presence will go with you and give you rest. The Lord spoke to the Apostle Paul. When he was asking for to take away his thorn in the flesh, and I'm so glad we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, because I think each of us can read ourselves into it just a little bit. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, because my power is made perfect in weakness. It's when we come to that place of dependence and trust as we walk with God, as we say, Father, give us this day our daily bread. He renews our strength. Past is gone. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. We have today and we have eternity. So let's walk with God today. Let's trust Him today that He will meet all of our needs, that He is strengthening us to be His light, to build His kingdom in this world around us. I just shared one of my nerdy little YouTube videos about this, but that passage about it. Do not be anxious. Don't worry about your life. Look at the birds, right? Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. God provides what they need. Jesus closes that section with, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. Miranda, I wonder if we could sing, Lord, I need you again. And I'll be happy to do the baby swap. (laughs) As she makes her way up here, can I pray for her? Father, that's maybe the greatest thing that we can be reminded of is how very much we need you. That even youths stumble and fall. And even young men get weary. Even those superstar athletes. Jesus, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we strike out on our own strength. And I think it's your grace that we don't get very far down the road before we remember just how much we really do need you. So Father, in this moment, and if this is the only moment today where we get this right, help us get it right. Let us come to you at the foot of the cross and declare our great need for you and trust that you'll meet us there. We pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.